Thank you, embellishments. Thank you for beginning uh, the worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, who knew that we would have a whole bunch of snow again, but uh, I believe it's going to melt by the end of the week. Uh, that's at least my hope. But we are here in the house of God. This is a time for us to worship together, focus upon God, and cast our hearts and our lives upon God, so that we can catch a glimpse of God in our worship together. So I'm glad that you are here in the house of God, and, uh, and this worship is coming to you live from the First United Methodist Church of East Greenbush, and I'm Pastor Sundar, and we have Jean Cheviak, and uh, Tom McLaughlin will be leading in the worship as well. And just a quick announcement, those who are children here, they are requested to come forward during the Young Disciples' time. And uh, we have a special story. You see the special candles in front of you. The purple candles are specifically for you. The story goes around with you in mind, and the rest of us learn from you as well. So don't miss it. Please do come. And those of you who are joining us on Facebook, uh, just uh, pay attention to it. If you, if you have children around, just gather them around to your, uh, around the table or around the TV set and to watch and listen to the story as well. Let's request that, Jean. Good morning. I'd like to add my welcome to all of you who are here in the sanctuary, those of you watching on Facebook, and everyone who will be looking at the service during the week on YouTube or Facebook recordings. We have lots of flowers in the sanctuary today. The lovely flowers on the altar were given by the Sandersons in honor and memory of loved ones. The extra flowers on the altar, the sunflowers, are given by the missions ministry in solidarity and support of the people of Ukraine, which we all understand. And the flowers on the piano this morning are from the funeral on Friday of Ruth Dishler. So we thank everyone who has um, graced our sanctuary with these beautiful flowers. And it's uh, nice to have the full bell choir back. You know, it's, uh, it's after a couple of years, it's really good to have them all up here again. And the only announcement this morning is going to be given by Tracy Haynes. Good morning. I'm here today to talk to you on behalf of the evangelism team. Unfortunately, the bus trip that we had planned on April 20th to go to Sight and Sound to see David in Lancaster, Pennsylvania is not going to happen on April 20th. Unfortunately, we did not meet the numbers for Yankee Trails. Um, we're not canceling the trip. We're going to do everything we can to reschedule it for maybe late summer, early fall. Um, however, anyone that has made a deposit for the April 20th trip, that deposit is going to be returned to you. Um, so we will be passing along information about the trip when we are going to have it as we get that information. Thank you. Good morning, and please stand for the call to worship. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning?
Oh my God, I cry by day and by night, but I find no rest. <laughs> Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. For God has not despised or adorned me. The affliction of the afflicted and the God has not hidden God's face from him. Please stay standard for the opening hymn, number 116, The God Abraham Praise from the Red Hymnal. Please join me in the opening prayer. Gracious Lord, as we continue our Lenten pilgrimage, we do so in view of your mercy. We encounter many hardships and much suffering in life. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit so that we may trust you through the trials and take up the cross to follow you. We pay through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Hi! You, you want to sit here on the floor? Do you want to sit in the seat here? Because I don't want to embarrass you. Can you sit down over here? Okay. All right. So come on. Come on, come on. Whoa, we've got lots of people. Come on over. Okay. You, some of you may remember who I am, and some of you may not. I haven't been telling the children's story for a while. But who knows who I am? Do you know who I am? No? No idea. Anybody know who I am? It's been a while, hasn't it? I am related to this guy up here. Do you know who that guy up there is sitting behind there? No. Pastor Sundar. There you go. Now, so do you think I'm his mother? No. Who do you think I am? I'm his wife. That's right. My name is Deb, and you can call me Deb. So this morning, I wanted to, I'm going to tip over in the stool, and I'm going to fall on the floor. I'm going to be in all kinds of trouble. I'm going to sit over here so I don't fall down. So I want to talk to you about this deal right here. Okay, what shape is that in? Can you tell? Can you tell what shape is it? What, it? what shape is it? It's a triangle. And a triangle has how many sides? Three. So this triangle is a lot like some theology that we know in um, the Christian church. And so we talk about the three in one. Hmm. So we talk about three names for God. And if God is one of the names, what's another name? Yep. Yes, that's another one. And there's one more. Yes. Yes, and what is the Lord's name? Jesus, that's right. So we are, have got Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. And this is what we look at coming up to Easter, uh, Easter time. Okay, and so the purple candles are, stand for the six Sundays in Lent. And Lent is a time that we, in the Christian church, focus on, who do you think we focus on during Lent? Jesus, that's right, Jesus. We yep, go ahead. 
you, it used to be that way. And people did that because they wanted to, they wanted to keep their mind, who do you think they wanted to keep their mind on? God or Jesus. So if they gave up something, it reminded them of that. And so people who grew up in the Catholic Church, and I think there's some people here probably that grew up in the Catholic Church. Raise your hand if you grew up in the Catholic Church. Anybody? A few people there. How many of you who have your hand up had to give up meat on Friday? Yep, and you got to eat what instead? Fish. Now, I would have been a real bad Catholic because I don't like fish. But anyway, anyway, so let's get back to the story here. So when we, when we look at this as children and as a church, we do this so that it reminds us with, as, with a visual to think about Jesus. So which of these candles here do you think represents Jesus? Anybody know down there? How about down there on the end? Which one of these candles do you think here represents Jesus? The white one, that's right. The white one because it's pure and, it's, and we think of white as being holy and clean, right? So the other candles here sort of represent those things that distract us from Jesus. Now, what does it mean to distract? Yep. Yeah, to draw our attention away from something. So um, because we want to not do that, during Lent, we think of some things to do to remind us of Jesus. Now, can you think of anything that might distract you away from Jesus as a kid? What might keep you from thinking about Jesus? What? Homework. <laughs> don't you love that? Um, yes, it could, but I, I don't want to use that as an example because homework is kind of important, right? How about, how about if I say two things and you tell me which distracts you more? Um, uh, electronic games or homework? It depends. <laughs> You're hedging your bets there, right? But I would say that most of the time... Homework takes longer. Okay, but it's a good thing. Jesus wants you to do your homework, right? Okay, you think? Okay, and he probably wants you to have fun too, but he wants you to balance that, right? Okay, so let's say that one of the things that distracts us then are those things that we spend so much time doing that we um, don't think about Jesus. So we got to blow out a candle for that then this morning. So who wants to go blow out one of the candles? Nobody? Oh my God, you do. You like to blow out candles, right? Can you blow out one without blowing all the other ones out? You think so? You want, yep. You want me to put my hand behind it for you? Oh, good job. Okay, now, because we're a week behind, we got to blow out another candle because we didn't really start on time. So how about something else? How about an attitude that might distract us from Jesus? Can you think of an attitude that might that might make you think only about yourself and not somebody else? Yes. Selfishness, and what were you gonna say? Jealousy, that's actually one that I was thinking about, and we'll talk about yours next week, okay? Jealousy, now what is exactly jealousy? Go ahead. When you wish you had something that you don't have that somebody else might have, what were you gonna say? You may, you may feel that way too. Now, if you're, if you're jealous, who are you thinking about? Or yourself, right? Now, when you're thinking about yourself all the time, are you thinking about Jesus? No. So we've got to blow out the jealousy candle now. You want to blow out the jealousy candle? Okay. Try not to blow out more than one candle, okay? Now, just the purple candle. Blow out one of those purple candles. Okay, good job. Now, as we blow these candles out, we're having less and less distraction from the Christ candle, right? The Jesus candle. So in the next four weeks, we're going to talk about what those other candles might represent. And then the only thing that will be left will be the Jesus candle, right? And that day, 
will be, what day do you think that'll be when we get to the Jesus candle? That's right, we'll be up to Easter then. So it's another way for us to count down to Easter. Can we pray together before you head off for Sunday school this morning? Okay, who wants to start the Lord's Prayer for us? Anybody know the Lord's Prayer? Kind of starts with our Father. Can we start that way? Do we know it? Okay, we're going to learn it if we don't. So let's close our eyes and let's everybody help us say our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, thank you for coming up, and I hope you'll all come the next four weeks and help us get those candles blown out, okay? Okay, thank you. You can go to Sunday school. good lesson for all of us, not just the children. So we'll all have to think about that too. And we come now to our time of scripture. And we begin this morning with the Old Testament chapter uh, numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. They marched from Mount Hor on the Reed Sea a, a road around the land of Edom. The people became impatient on the road. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why did you bring us up from Egypt to kill us in the desert where there is no food or water? And we detest this miserable bread. So the Lord set poisonous snakes among the people and they bit the people. Many of the Israelites died. The people went to Moses and said, we've sinned for we spoke against the Lord and you. Pray to the Lord so that he will send the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous snake and place it on a pole. Whoever is bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake and placed it on a pole. If a snake bit someone, that person could look at the bronze snake and live. Continuing on to the New Testament, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. You were called to this kind of endurance because Christ suffered on your behalf. He left you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor did he ever speak in ways meant to deceive. When he was insulted, he did not reply with insults. When he suffered, he did not threaten revenge. Instead, he trusted himself to the one who justifies justly. He carried in his own body on the cross the sins we committed. He did this so that we might live in righteousness, having nothing to do with sin. By his wounds, you were healed. Though you were like straying sheep, you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your lives. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Jesus went home with Peter and saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. Then she got up and served them. That evening, people brought to Jesus many who were demon-possessed. He threw the spirits out with just a word. He healed everyone who was sick. This happened so that what Isaiah the prophet said would be fulfilled. He is the one who took our illnesses and carried away our diseases. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn this morning is number 286, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Please stand if you are able.
Here we are in the second week of Lent, and uh, a special welcome to Trudy. We just saved the snow just for you for returning from Florida. I want to welcome all of you who are here, and uh, we want to thank God for the, God's wonderful ways of keeping us together in so many ways. Benjamin Franklin once quipped that there are two certainties we all encounter, death and taxes. And with your permission, I would like to add another certainty, suffering. We all face suffering in life, whether it be now or eventually. All you need to do is visualize that this is, or to watch your TV screens or read the daily newspaper, you see suffering all around us. We hear of terrorist attacks and threats of retaliation. Innocent people are injured and killed by artillery in wars and gunfire in the streets of our cities and natural disasters, be they earthquakes in California, hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, tornadoes in the heartland, devastate property and lives. Children go hungry, children go missing, children go homeless, the poor struggle, injustice deprives citizens of their fundamental rights and freedoms. Closer to home, there is more personal evidence that Suffering surrounds us. The economy goes sour, we lose employment. Families experience the turmoil of domestic conflicts and even breakups. We witness our own bodies deteriorate as we age. Disease and cancer and injury become our uninvited companions. Lost dreams and depression and plague us. Eventually, we become, we become ignited companions. So we all experience suffering of some kind. Suffering surrounds us all. Eventually, it afflicts us all. The existence of suffering has led many people to reject Christian faith. Famous voices such as Burton Russell and Steve Jobs, the one who created iPhone, regarded the reality of pain and sorrow to be the clinching argument against the idea of a loving God. He did not believe that such a loving God would bring such disaster in his own life as he suffered from cancer. And I believe he's experiencing the full effects of God's unconditional love even as he enjoys the afterlife. And oftentimes we kind of shortchange ourselves of the joy when we get angry against God. But the Bible does not ignore the messy reality of the world. Nowhere does Christianity deny the existence of pain and suffering. Indeed, the Bible unequivocally declares that this is a fallen world. It's a broken planet. We don't live in a perfect world. Especially during the season of Lent, do Christians acknowledge the reality of suffering. But Lent provides us with a new lens through which to view suffering. That is through the lens of God's mercy. In it, we see God who entered our suffering to bear our suffering and to bring healing to all of us. People have asked me so many times, and I've asked myself, why is there suffering in the world? That's a heavy question. But the scripture says that the answer is because there is sin in the world. God created the world without suffering when humanity rebelled against God's perfect plan. Sin along with suffering was introduced by mankind. When humanity decided to go its separate ways from God, said, I don't need your plan, God. I can do it by all by myself. I'm pretty smart. I can figure this life out. Sure, we can figure this life out. We are pretty smart. We are truly intelligent people. But God gives us the freedom to use that intelligence not to conditionally love him, but to unconditionally love him. God gives us the freedom to love God back. But sometimes we walk away from God. It says that the time of suffering entered the world and thorns and thistles were introduced into our lives. So the problem is not pain and suffering. It is not the crime and illness, not catas catastrophes that plague life. These are only symptoms of a deeper problem that has affected 
all humanity. The problem is sin. And each of us has been infected with it. Nevertheless, these results from sinful and fallen world are painful. Suffering is real. In the book, Migrants, Sharecroppers, and Mountaineers, a poverty-stricken mother described an incident in which her husband lost his temper at a preacher who was speaking on the topic of suffering, like me today, in a tent meeting. Then she said, I quote, then my husband did a worst thing he could do. He took the baby Annie and he held her right before his face, the preachers, and he screamed and hollered at him. He told him there was our little Annie. She's never been to the doctor and the child is sick. We have no money for the other children, neither do we have any money for ourselves. Then he told the preacher, he was like all the rest, making money of us. He held Annie as high as he could, right near the cross and told God he better stop having preachers speaking for him. He should see us himself. If you really want to know we are, how we are suffering, see for yourself, God. Here is my Annie. Here I am. See for yourself. The migrant father sums up the dilemma of pain and suffering about as well as it can be expressed. Why are they sick children? Why is there no money and little hope among so many? You have held similar feelings as these. But there is one point in the father's tirade in which he was mistaken. He demanded that God come down and see for himself the suffering in this world. Yet God did exactly that. Not only did God see what suffering is like, God experienced it to the fullest. God felt what it's like to suffer. For above all people in the history, Jesus Christ suffered the most. So the cause of suffering is human sin. The cure for suffering is the Christ, cross of Christ, Christ's cross. God's own son came down to this fallen world and experienced the effects of this devastating imperfections, its ugliness, its cruelty, its suffering. Christ was treated with more contempt and injustice than we ever will know. He was betrayed by friends and rejected by his people. He was humiliated, stripped and mocked and ridiculed and beaten. The scripture lesson which was read to us from 1 Peter 2, 22 to 23 describes he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to God who judges justly. The cross on which Jesus dies was not a pretty sight. It was meant to produce supreme suffering. Christ was nailed to the cross and crucified, scrapped against the splintered lumber of the beam. Jesus' body was a continuous contorted movement as he struggled from a slow suffocation. His pain was excruciating. In fact, which is where we get the word excruciating means out of a crucifixion. The word excruciating comes out, out of the crucifixion. The pain is so unbearable, there is no cure for that. When somebody was nailed to the cross, there was no cure for that. There was no resuscitation for that, no living after that. There are times in our own lives we feel excruciating pain, and it could be physical or mental or spiritual or sadness in that way. But we feel that we have no other alternative Crucifixion is the most terrible experience of pain and suffering that our minds can imagine. More than anyone else, Christ tasted the curse that was brought about by the first parents, their sin and our sin. But the good news is it's also brought about the reversal of that curse. The cross before which the migrant father held up his baby is the very symbol that God shared in our pain and suffering and death. Not only did he share that, Christ experienced it in our place. So we can therefore trust the Lord through all our suffering because he endured it with us and for us. Yes, God knows what suffering in this world is like. 
because Christ's sacrificial and substitutionary suffering. We are made whole and healed from our greatest ailments, the sickness of sin. You know, every time I was watching the news about the war in Ukraine, I would talk to, I was very angry at a lot of our leaders, extremely angry. Not very is not the right word. What are we waiting for? I said to myself. Why have we circled our wagons? Let those people suffer. So I would call them names, and my, my wife would roll her eyes, and she said, take it easy, kind of. There was a lot of unanswered ang agony and anguish watching children and parents and countries be devastated. And this is the prayer, something which reminded me of that. Oh, you may help, come quickly to my aid. Oh, you may help, come quickly to my aid. How often have we said that to God? How often our friends and our neighbors said that to us? Oh, you may help, come quickly to my aid. There's a whole nation of people are crying, Oh, you may help, come quickly to our aid. Yes, God knows what suffering in this world is like. And we are made whole and healed from our greatest sickness of sin. Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter wrote in our text, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Because Jesus has definitely dealt with the cause of suffering sin. We can certainly trust him to deal compassionately with the symptoms of our suffering, the pains and sorrows we experience in life. So the cause of suffering is sin. The cure for suffering is the cross of Christ. And finally, a new perspective on suffering. It is God's mercy. Because Jesus endured suffering on our behalf, we can endure as well. Verse 21 reminds us, for to us, for, for, the, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his footsteps. For this you have been called. It's not just for information only. For this you have been called. The church has been called for this. So that you might walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Just as he bore the suffering of the entire world and humanity, you and I are called to bear that suffering. You and I are called to get on our knees and plead with God for mercy. Entering the Christian life does not mean that suffering is automatically withdrawn from us. In fact, it may mean just the opposite, that we will experience more hostility from the world just as Jesus did. Jesus suffered and we are called to follow him. But the cross provides us with the strength to endure our sufferings because it transforms suffering. Just as God's power transformed the horrific sufferings of Jesus on the cross into the ultimate victory of God over sin, so also God's power can transform our suffering into his means of growth and maturity. We do not view suffering with new eyes from a renewed perspective, we do so in view of God's mercy. Just as God has mercy upon us. In mercy, God, Christ suffered to atone for our sin. Now in our suffering, we focus on the never failing mercy. Of now in our suffering, we never failing mercy of God and trust in his plans for us. So I'm beginning to learn as I watch the TV, the suffering going on. What is the plan here, God? And I'm sure this is not God's plan that people in Ukraine should suffer such horrendously. But what is your plan, God? What is your plan for me? What do you want me to do? 
What do we in the United States, what do we in the in Upper New York Conference, in the United Methodist Church, are called to do during this hour? Are we to wring our hands and say, I'm helpless? Are we to draw a red line and say, if you cross this, I'm going to do something about it, till then I won't? There are so many unanswered questions for me. I'm going to share this with you. And pray with me. Pray that God will give all of us the courage to do the right thing. Corey ten Boom provides us with a powerful example of the transformative power of suffering in view of God's mercy. Corey's family was persecuted by the Nazis for protecting Jews during World War II. Corey and her sister Betsy suffered incredible hardships in the concentration camp in which they were unjustly incarcerated. In the midst of all that misery, however, Betsy proclaimed a message of transformative faith. When Corey lamented about the pit of suffering they were in, Betsy replied, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Betsy knew that life is painful, but God's mercy is even more powerful. Apostle Peter wrote about Jesus saying, by his wounds you have been healed. During this Lent and always, may we remember the horrific suffering Christ experienced on the cross for us. May we also never forget the healing and hope that came from that sacrifice. My prayer for all of us, for our nation, for our humanity, let us ever draw upon his healing strength that now comes, us, comes to us in our suffering. As we suffer watching these pictures, as we anguish seeing people, families separated, children separated, lost in this turmoil, let us humble ourselves before God and pray for those who need our support, who need our comfort, who need our uplifting, that they will overcome and look forward to that day when God will bless them beyond their imaginations. Let us pray. Merciful God, in your mercy you have saved us. In your mercy you have let your son Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God, to suffer on the cross for us. In your mercy you draw us to bless us beyond anything we can imagine in the days to come. Bless your people who are gathered here. Send them forth with your blessing and send them with strong hearts, quick feet, deep love, so that your name and your kingdom be built upon this earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings.
join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication? O oh Lord, you are God. By your grace, we reap the abundant harvest. As you have fed us by your mercy, may it be our daily bread to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We come now to our time of joys and concerns, and we have several joys today, which is really nice. Um, senior luncheons were back this past week, and 42 people joined in fellowship on a snowy afternoon. And also, another joy, the youth group last week delivered 45 love kits to the homeless shelter in Albany. That's really a, an amazing joy. And another joy from someone who's been on our prayer list for a long time. Judy Green is feeling much better, so we're glad to hear that. And I have a bunch of birthdays this week. A lot of people having birthdays. Anna Reet's birthday, um, she's the daughter of Deb and, and Pastor Sundar. Her birthday is tomorrow on the 14th. And Keegan D'Ambrosi is the 15th. Jennifer Pyle, the 18th. And Owen Valentius on the 21st. So those are the birthdays we heard about this week. As always, we have many, many, many concerns. Um, of course, we have to mention the situation in Ukraine, which is, is really terrible. And also, we would mention the family and friends of Ruth Dishter upon her recent passing, the family and friends of Judy Marcusinis upon her recent passing. We pray for Paige Johnson, Evelyn Cooper, Melanie Berger, John Hill, Marianne Johanning. We pray for Laura Clark, Joan Fryer, the world leaders and the people of Ukraine, Cheryl Lambert, Nellie Smith, John Moore, Sherry St. Louis. We pray for the Snyder family, for George Conley, for Patty Chartrand's nephew, Eric, for Janet Morrissey, Matthew Ecker, Alex Perry Roberts, Pam Nunziato. We pray for Stephen Frawley, Russ Van Buren, Sherry St. Louis's niece, the D'Ambrosi family, Amanda Trainer's husband, Matthew. We pray for Linda and her family, Deb Samuel, Jane Schweikert, Judy and Ed Fountain, Samuel Steinbuck, Marie Simmons, Tracy and Don Haynes' niece Amanda, Lauren Moulton. We pray for Jerry and Shirley Dunn, Sandy Comrie, Betty Lennon, Catherine Nardacci, Kenneth Jackson, Randy Veeley, Gwen Smith, Fred Van Ornum, Judy Davis, Sandy Cummings, Louise Wells, Stephen Burnett, Eric Subic, David Smith and his daughter, Sally, Paul Smith, Claudia Emmerich, Richard Smith. And we pray for all of the residents of Riverside, Rosewood, Eddie Heritage House, Van Rensselaer Manor, Peregrine Assisted Living, Collar City Nursing and Rehabilitation, and Hawthorne Ridge. We pray for all of these people as we sing together our call to prayer. Holy God, we 
humble ourselves before you today. We, your people, gather in your holy sanctuary, set apart to come and meet you here in a very special way, to, to catch a glimpse of you, to worship together with joy in praise and thanksgiving, to offer you our best, to give you all our all. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that you are here amongst us in your risen power. You call us and you send us forth in your power. We pray that you would continue to pour your spirit upon all of us here. We thank you for our young children and their teachers, our Sunday school and our youth. We pray for our men and women. We pray for our choir and all those who are involved in so many ministries in our community of faith and around this community. We thank you and praise you for the gifts you have entrusted to us, for the faithfulness with which we use them. We pray that you would continue to increase our understanding of who you are, to trust you, to give you the grace, to give you the glory as you give us the grace. Lord God, we lift up all the names which are mentioned this morning. You know their needs and we do not need to ask you, but yet we come before you and you ask us to come and place before you our burdens. We ask you to heal them and restore them and strengthen them, protect and preserve them. Watch over them, Lord, and bring them into your church once more. Almighty and ever-living God, we pray for our president and those who are in authority. We pray for all the NATO countries. We pray for Ukraine, men and women, children. We pray for Russia, for their men and women and children. We pray for the leaders of this world. We pray that you would stop them in their tracks. They may not continue to hurt the innocent. They may not continue to destroy the lives which you have created. They may not continue to destroy the works of human beings by destroying buildings. We pray, O oh God, that you will intervene and speak to the leaders, bring peace in their hearts, that peace that passes all understanding they might refrain from war. We continue to lift up our president and vice president and those who are in authority. Give them your grace and give them your strength and direction to protect those who need protection in this sacred hour. Almighty and ever-living God, send us forth from here with your heavenly benediction. Pour your spirit upon us for the working of the, your spirit throughout this week. May we continue to live for you and love you and serve you. This I pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 359.
Please join me in the benediction prayer. Let us pray together. Let us pray. May the merciful God, who suffered the pain of the cross for you and for your salvation, strengthen you to trust him through hardship according to his good and gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen.